Now, we started last year going through Matthew. It's taken us a while to get there. We got there's a lot of weeks of Sermon on the Mount we had to get through, uh, but it's been good. This series is going to just shoot us right through chapter 11, our new series, Good in All Time. See, Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He's always the same. And so instead of all in good time, we looked at this chapter in chapter 11. And so Jesus is good in all time. See what we did there? Now, it's not a hard and fast thing that Matthew's doing here, but I thought it was kind of a neat way to break up chapter 11 here. Is that Jesus is good past, present, and future. And so this week, we're going to take a look at the past. We'll actually go past, future, present, but we'll get to those next week. This week we start with the past. We've got a lot that we're covering this week, and it begins in Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. It says, When Jesus had finished instructing His twelve disciples, He went on from there to teach and preach in their city. So we were just in chapter 10. Before Easter, we had covered that. And so He's just done some teaching. He's just answered some questions, answered some, uh, he sent the disciples out, they're going out, he's telling them, hey, persecution's going to come, it's okay, there's going to be rewards though for people that help you as you go do this work, all of those sorts of things happen, and then we get, Jesus goes out and he's teaching and preaching again. It says, now when John heard in prison, this is John the Baptist, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Jesus, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Jesus answered him, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the law and the prophets prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you didn't sing. You didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet... Wisdom is justified by her deeds. That's a lot that we just covered there. And there's three things primarily that I want to really zone in on in this passage. And the first thing is this. Your doubts do not define you. Your doubts do not define you. Even John the Baptist doubted Jesus. John the Baptist, this is the guy who's so sold out for the mission that God has him on, he's off 
wearing camel hair, eating locusts in the wilderness, just dunking people and preaching. Like, there's no one, Jesus says, there's no one greater that has ever lived than John the Baptist. This is the greatest man that ever lived. And even John the Baptist goes, are we sure this is the guy? Even he has a doubt. See, because Jesus wasn't really the Messiah John the Baptist was expecting. If we go all the way back to Matthew chapter 3, where John's preaching, what's he saying? He's like, yeah, I'm baptizing with, with water, but there's one coming after me, and he's going to baptize with fire, and the axe is at the root, and he's chopping the whole tree down. You better watch out. He's coming for you. And then Jesus shows up, and he's ministering to people. He's healing people. He's spending time with the poor and preaching to them. And John's sitting in prison going, wait a second. This isn't what I had in mind. This isn't what I thought this was going to look like. He's expecting the Messiah to come and bodies to start flying, basically. And what he gets is he gets Jesus. And so we can kind of relate to that, right? Because we've all, any adult in the room has had that experience where you have these plans for your life and you think it's going to go exactly according to plan and then it looks nothing like that in actuality. I mean, the video that we showed for the Blended and Blessed event, these two families that, like, well, it started as one family that they thought they had this plan and then life takes them in completely different directions. Leaving for college, I was sure that after college, I'm going to be a youth pastor somewhere. I'll be a youth pastor for a little bit and I'll graduate to being like a real pastor, right? <laughs> Never in a million years did I think that I would live downtown Washington, D.C., and that my job would not be a youth pastor, that I'd be a media pastor, that a church was going to pay me to oversee video production and graphic design and branding and all this. I didn't even know that was a job. And then I get married in D.C., and then we leave there, and we come to Wisconsin. And even that, if you've been here long enough, you know that I did not come here to be the lead pastor of Lakeside. I came here to be the associate pastor of Lakeside, and God had other plans. And so life has a way of not going the way that you think it will. And surely many of you have similar stories that you can say, yeah, we thought this was going to happen and then this bundle of joy showed up. Or we thought this was going to happen and life just took me another way. And so John's sitting in prison and he's looking at the way things have gone and he's thinking about Jesus and he's saying, is this the guy? And Jesus gives this reply that sort of rounds the edges off. He's not very sharp with John. He gives this reply to him. He could have come down hard on him. He could have lashed out. He could have like, well, John, you're doubting me, and so this is a big problem, and I'm going to bring the hammer down. But that's not what he does. He's very gentle in this reply that he gives John. He lays out these things he's been doing as Messiah. And then he just says, man, blessed is the one that's not offended by me. John, don't be offended that I'm not what you expected, but trust me, I'm the guy. It's normal to have doubts or periods of time where we're uncertain. And Jesus doesn't seem too bothered that John has one here. It's normal to have a season of doubt in your walk with Christ. It's normal, it's normal to have periods of doubt in anything you do, in your marriage, your career path. But you're going to have those times where you're like, man, did, am I doing the right thing? Is this right? And there are two extremes that I've seen churches take with doubt, and I think they're both wrong. There's one side that says doubt is just it's evil, 
and it's wrong, and so you just deny it. You just manufacture certainty and you just stuff that doubt way down and eventually it'll just go away and you'll forget about it. Doubt's evil, it's wrong, you don't want to be a doubter, do you? And so, no. And then there's sort of the other extreme where there, I've heard people, and this is sort of a more recent phenomenon, to me at least, where people want to just like, yeah, let's just live in the doubt. Let's just embrace it all and let's just doubt and who even knows, man? And like, just sort of this like laissez-faire, like whatever, we, who knows what we even believe anymore. Until all you're really left with is doubts. You don't have beliefs anymore. You, this is our statement of doubts here at this church. Like, <laughs> instead, what I think we should do is kind of write down the middle, work through our doubts. Let's not ignore them. Let's not deny them. Let's not pretend that we don't have them. But let's not pretend that they're good things either. Let's work through them. In Mark's Gospel, there's this child that Jesus heals. And... Jesus asked the boy's father, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And he says, I believe. Help my unbelief. Like, <laughs> there, I believe. Trust me, I do. But there's a little part of me that's going, I don't know about this. Help me with that. And that's what I think we should aim for, is working through our doubt. Do the work to study and learn and grow. Your doubts can be things that cause you to stretch and grow. Faith is something that we're told is a gift that we can pray for. Faith is confidence and trust in Jesus. Pray for that. I hit a point in college where I had some pretty serious doubts. Mind you, I'm at Bible college, and I'm sitting there going, I don't know if I believe this anymore. All of my classes are like, I'm going from like New Testament survey to 1 Corinthians class. And like, so, like, I'm going, I don't know if I buy this. And it may be surprising given my line of work. I'm an intensely skeptical person. I'm the kind of person that will point out that, gee, since smartphones are ubiquitous and like every person has a camera on them at all times, we really have seen a big decrease in like Bigfoot sightings and ghost sightings, haven't we? That's weird. Huh. How about that? I, I really appreciate science, and I actually mean that in a way that like most people who say they appreciate science like just like pictures of nebula and like pithy quotes from Neil deGrasse Tyson or something like that. We had this march for science yesterday on Earth Day. Uh, I really appreciate science. What always happens is, like, whenever I see a study online about, like, okay, we found, there's this new study that found such and such, I'll, like, I'm the kind of guy that's, like, I'm trying to find the link in the article to the original study because I want to go read the abstract. Because most of the time, the people who write about science are science illiterate, and so they don't actually know what they're talking about. And so it killed me on Friday. USA Today has this on their homepage. They've got the, the big thing is, why don't people trust science anymore? And then right next to that is this article on study found that links artificial sweetener and diet soda to dementia. And I'm like, that's why people, because you just say crazy things. That's not what the study found. It, and correlation is not causation. And do I have to explain this to you when you're a science writer? Like, <laughs> and so, and, and that one was from USA Today, but I see on Facebook all the time, people are like, ooh, I found this thing on like livegreenearthpeople.com or whatever. And it's like, if a website is telling you it's bias in the domain name, maybe take what it has to say with a grain of salt. I'm getting off track here. <laughs> Which proves my point. Is I'm, I'm just, I'm naturally a logical, skeptical kind of dude. And I'm sitting at college and I'm questioning my faith. I'm going, does this make sense anymore? Is there, are there logical 
rational reasons to believe this. And so what I did was I kept studying and I kept reading, and it helped that I was surrounded by professors who were brilliant and also great men of God. I think of Dr. Marino, who, if I say the term absent-minded professor, you all just pictured Dr. Marino. Uh, he, absolutely brilliant, a wee bit unorganized, uh, and his theology and apologetics classes literally changed my life. Uh, I think of Dr. Gavin, who taught the science classes at our college, who was, as Dr. Marino would state it, literally designing trees at the genetic level. There's a lot of talk about GMOs. This is the guy that was doing the GM to the O's. That a science that was this brilliant had this deep faith in Jesus resonated. And it made me want to keep pushing. Think of uh, Dr. Sheets, a brilliant New Testament scholar. Uh, one of the books that I occasionally reference when I'm preparing messages out of the New Testament, he wrote a chapter for. And it's actually one of the chapters that I go back to in that quite a bit. What he taught me was to look at what the Bible actually says and to try to strip away. We all have lenses that we come at it with, right? From where we grew up, what kind of church we grew up in, all of those sorts of things. We all have lenses that we view it through. And he was like, you got to take those off as best you can and see what it actually says. And our, I'll never forget, it was Intro to Biblical Interpretation. And he would just occasionally just throw up a passage and be like, all right, so what's this mean? And we'd all say the thing that like, we'd all been taught in a good Assemblies of God Sunday school. And he'd be like, really? Read that again for me. And you'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> it was awesome. And I think that's part of it too, is that sometimes doubt comes from clinging too tightly to things the Bible doesn't actually say. Or, the, or issues that aren't really important or central. I'll give a relatively benign example because I don't want to start a fight this morning or anything. But I grew up in a church thinking that the Bible absolutely, no question, banned the consumption of alcohol for Christians. Like 100% banned completely. I knew about communion wine. I thought it was different for some reason. Uh, I had no idea about the long history of like Belgian monks making beers and digestifs and all of those sorts of things. I was just told the Bible just banned it outright. And then I go to college and I start studying the Bible and I'm like, wait, this argument's on some really shaky footing. <laughs> like, I, the Bible warns against abusing alcohol. But drinking it is actually commanded once in the Old Testament and commanded once in the New Testament. Jesus makes it <laughs> and drinks it. As we saw today, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. There's not really a biblical argument there at all. Now, there are plenty of other good reasons to abstain from drinking alcohol. And, of course, sobriety is roundly praised and desired in the New Testament. We're told not to be mastered by anything but Jesus, and so... If you have a problem with alcohol, you should probably avoid it completely. But we have people at Lakeside here that drink, and we have people at Lakeside here that don't drink, and neither of those groups of people are living in sin. There are people who love Jesus and agree on the majors, but disagree on all sorts of other things. Baptism, do you practice infant baptism or believer's baptism? Church membership, does that mean anything for you? And what does that look like? Book of Genesis, how do you view the beginning of creation? Book of Revelation, how do you view the end of creation? Now, I've got opinions on what the Bible is saying about all of those things. But there are people who are 100% my brothers and sisters in Christ who view those things completely differently. Some of them are present even now, right? <laughs> Thank you.
And so I obviously decided there are good and logical reasons to believe in a God and to believe specifically in the resurrection of Jesus. There's no one argument that was a slam dunk for me. And Tim Keller in his book, The Reason for God, calls them all clues. They're not so much, none of them are like a solid proof, but built up together, there's a lot of clues to clue us in that something more is happening than what uh, we can identify just through our five senses here. That's one of the reasons why I have his book in my office. Again, finally this morning, I remembered to bring it. Um, to give out to people for exactly that reason, because I think it does a great job. And it's funny how the arguments that weren't convincing to me at all in college, now I find more convincing and sort of back and forth. And, and so Keller's book, which I didn't have back then, I wish I did because it's brilliant. Um, it's, uh, if you, and if you find like some of the apologetics books corny, which like um, I kind of do sometimes, uh, this one is not that at all. Uh, it's pretty great. But the point is this. like, There are logical and rational reasons. I came through that doubt. I didn't stop there. I kept studying. I kept learning. And God used that to grow me. And now I can identify with someone when they're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a logical reason to believe there's a God. I'll go, oh, really, tell me more. Because I've been there. And now I'm through the other side. And I believe quite strongly that Jesus rose from the dead. That something happened on that April morning in AD 30 or 33. Look, the point is this. Your doubt does not define you. Don't throw up your hands and say, like, well, I've got these doubts, so I guess I'll, I'm just doubt forever now. Work through those doubts. G Bring them to the Lord. Do the work. Hang on and you'll come through it the other side. Your doubts do not define you. The second thing is this. Praise publicly. Criticize privately. This is not a big point in this passage, but it's here, so I want to just call attention to it. When Jesus deals with John's doubt, He doesn't do it out in the open. He does that privately with John's disciples. I mean, he can't do it with John. John's in prison, so he does it with John's disciples. And then when he's going to praise John and talk about how amazing John is, that's when he turns to the crowd and starts talking. He praises publicly, he criticizes privately. When we're dealing with people, that's the best way to treat them. Praise them in front of everybody, criticize them, Privately, we have a culture now who likes to really do this backwards, right? Like public shaming is back in full force. When people see something they don't like, they pile on on social media. It gets real bad. It gets ugly. And if you're sitting there thinking like it's all on the other side, you're probably part of the problem, right? <laughs> it's real talk. I still love you. So in social media lingo here, praise in the comments, criticize and private messages, right? In doing so, what you do is you build people up instead of tearing them down. It's, this isn't saying there's not room for criticizing people. There, there is. And there's occasionally times where, I remember one where I saw a friend of mine from college had posted something on Facebook, and I was like, man, that's a terrible idea. And I didn't put in the comments like, dude, what are you doing? Like, don't it. I sent him a private message. It was like, hey man, so this thing you posted, like, I'm not really I'm not really sure what that's accomplishing here. And so we had a good conversation about it. I was able to call that out in him. People have been able to do that with me. And so what you do when you do this is you don't embarrass people, you actually give them criticism that they can work with, that they can grow from. And then when you turn to people, when you're in public and you praise them publicly, that just feels good. Everybody loves that. And so you build people up this way, and it's what John gets here from Jesus. Jesus gives these like word pictures for John, right? Would you see a reed blowing in the wind? Was he just this wishy-washy guy? 
No, can't say that about John the Baptist at all. Right? If anybody's hard and fast, man, it's John the Baptist. This is the guy that's going, maybe Jesus isn't strong enough. Or <laughs> you're like, right? Of course not. You go see someone in fancy clothes, you go see a fashion show out there. Like, no, this guy's just wearing camel hair. This guy's rough and tumble. People in those clothes aren't out in the wilderness. They're in kink's houses. Did you go see a prophet? Yeah, you did, and you saw more than a prophet, Jesus says. Not, not just a prophet, not just a prophet that prophesies, but this is a prophet who was prophesied about. Jesus paraphrases Malachi 3.1 here, where it says, Behold, I send my messenger. So this is the Lord speaking. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to... And on and on. It's the first part that he paraphrase is there. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And when Jesus paraphrases it, it's, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So he's making it, he's showing you that the Scripture's about himself. So if John is the one who is next to last, what does that make? Jesus. Last, right? John is more than a prophet. What is Jesus? More than, more than a prophet. Which leads us sort of into the main idea this morning. Is that Jesus is the promised Messiah. This is the past part of this. From long ago, the prophets prophesied about Jesus. They knew He was coming. They knew He would be Savior. The people... In John's day, they had a little bit different of an idea of what he was going to be like. That's why John's tripped up here a little bit. They think Messiah's coming and he's going to lead a political movement. That he's going to take down Rome, he's going to institute the reign of God here on earth. So they expected Jesus not to be out in small towns doing miracles. They expected Jesus to be in Jerusalem drumming up support from the upper class. <coughs> Excuse me. God, I'm getting dry up here. I think one of my medications, one of my new ones, is just killing my throat. So they expect Jesus not to be out in small towns. They expect Him to be in Jerusalem, in the holy city, getting the elites together, getting, a, getting the band together, and they're going to take down Rome. Like That's what they're expecting here. And the reality is different. Is Jesus isn't with the elite. He's with the poor. He's spending time with insignificant people. The poor. The poor in spirit. He's got a message, but it's not the fire and brimstone John was expecting. Instead, it's moral. And it's kind of the opposite of what they're looking for, right? They want a Messiah who says, I'm coming to wage war. Instead, Jesus shows up and goes, don't retaliate. If you get struck in one cheek, turn the other. Like, That's not what we had in mind. To say it throws everybody for a loop is a bit of an understatement here. But for us now, we can look at, we have sort of the whole story to look at. We can see how Jesus was promised throughout Scripture. We look at the whole picture, and the picture shows us that the whole Bible is about Jesus. When John's disciples come, and they ask Jesus, hey, are you the one? Or like, You can just toss it. They ask, like, are you the one or should we look for another one? And Jesus gives them all these references that go back to Isaiah. It's not one particular verse, but it's all of this language from Isaiah that John's going to hear and immediately go, I see what you did there. Like, he's going to catch all these references. And then Jesus says that all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. What does that mean? All the law and the prophets, that was the way that they referred to the whole Old Testament, the whole Torah. The law and the prophets, kind of what they call that, because you got the law up front, you got the prophets in the back. All the law and the prophets. And so all of that, Jesus says, that all prophesied until John. And what happens to John? Well, John starts telling, pointing everybody to Jesus. He starts preparing the way for him. So they're all there up to a point 
And then at that point, Jesus kicks in this new thing because John's the one who is to come to pave the way for Jesus, to make the road easy for him. Jesus calls him the Elijah. What's up with that? Well, that's another verse from Malachi. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so it had really gotten wired into the Jewish mentality at that point that Elijah was coming back. Because remember, Elijah goes up in a, like this chariot of fire. He doesn't die a normal death. He sort of has this like ascension in the Old Testament. And so they're like, well, maybe he's, he's coming back, he himself. And so this was so wired in that when Jesus is on the cross, right? He says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. One of the Gospels points out that the people around there think he's calling to Elijah. Oh, he must be calling to Elijah, because right, because Elijah. And so Jesus is going, no, 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 John is that Elijah that is coming, that's preparing the way. And so the whole Old Testament, Jesus is saying, the whole Old Testament is about Jesus. And so that's the way we should read it. We shouldn't read the Old Testament and look for what it has to tell us about ourselves. We should look for what it has to tell us about God and what it has to tell us about Jesus. David and Goliath, perfect example. We shouldn't read the David and Goliath story and then think like, okay, so I'm David, so what are the Goliaths in my life? And I have, if I have the three sm smooth stones of faith, hope, and tithing, then I can slay the Goliaths in my life, right? No, we read that. Jesus is David. Who are we? We're Israel, just standing on the sidelines watching Jesus win the battle for us. Because he is conquered and he is victorious, and we share in this victory that we didn't earn. And so the whole Bible, all of it, it's about Jesus. He's the promised Messiah who has come for all of us. And so we can marvel at that can marvel at the Bible because of what it tells us about Jesus, because we can see this plan put into motion. From the foundations of the universe, it was always going to lead us to Jesus. The gospel was always God's plan from the beginning of time until the end of it. God loved you so much that before he even made you, he already had in motion that Jesus would come and die for you. Think about that. He was thinking of you before your mama and your daddy ever met. He was thinking of you before he ever made your mama and your daddy. Before all time, he's thinking of you, and he loved you so much that he was providing Jesus as a way to spend eternity with you. He has always been crazy in love with you, and He expresses that through the Gospel. Through this Jesus, crucified in your place so that you could spend eternity with Him. The promised Messiah who is to come, who came and paved the way for all of us. And so this puts the onus on us to make a decision. Jesus sort of likens the crowd. To, you're like kids at the marketplace. One commentator is very impressed here that Jesus even notices this. Because other rabbis in that day, they're not going to pay attention to kids playing. Jesus is different. Jesus is watching how the kids are playing in the marketplace. Like, oh, what are they doing? And they're just singing and dancing. And some of them, you know, they'll sing and they do morning games, apparently. Doesn't sound fun to me, but hey, what do I know? <laughs> And so he's like, the crowd won't respond to me or to John, right? We play happy music, you don't dance. We play sad music, you don't mourn. What do you want us to do here? Jesus and John have very different approaches, and they both get rejected. John was too severe for him. He comes and he doesn't eat like them. He doesn't drink like them. They're like, that guy's got a demon. He's just crazy. And Jesus comes and he eats like them and he drinks like them. And they're like, well, but he hangs out with the wrong people. He, he's got to be a sinner too. Surely no serious rabbi is going to be hanging out with just anybody and, and eating and drinking like all of us. And he's like, what do you want? 
You've got balls of burden. You reject both of them. You don't make any sense. We can't make you happy either way. We go this way, eh, you don't like it. You go this way, eh, I don't like it. No matter what package it's put in, you won't accept it. And so the choice here is for all of us still today is that will we accept Jesus or not? The long-promised Messiah who has come to set us free. Will we accept Him? Will we put our faith and our trust in Him and receive from His grace this free gift of salvation? Or will we reject Him like the crowd? Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that You have been prophesied about, that You had been foretold, that we can see in Your Word this incredible thread that is woven from the very beginning until the very end that speaks to who You are and what You have done for all of us. Lord, I pray that You would give us an appreciation for Your Word, for what You are showing us here, what You are showing us through all that You have to say to us. that we would have faith and trust in You as a result. That Your Holy Spirit would be speaking to our hearts right now. Drawing us to You. Calling us to place our faith and our trust in the long promised Messiah who has come and paid the price for all of us. We thank You in Jesus' name. Amen.